We now have all the machinery we require in order to derive the a sub n's. In order to do this, we multiply the Fourier series across by cosine m r. So m not equal to n, and we integrate this on minus to positive pi. So I've written that Fourier series here. Now I'm not going to perform the integrals because we've already seen that when we integrate the product of a cosine and a sine like this, that is going to integrate to zero. And when we integrate this particular cosine here, it's also going to go to zero. So we're simply left with the summation outside of the integral of the product of cosines. But as we saw a moment ago, this is essentially no good to us unless m is equal to n and non-zero. So let's assume that that is the case. How do, we, how do we find out that the integral of cosine squared is in fact pi? Now there are many different ways of doing this. Well, there are mainly two different ways of doing this. I've done one uh, a different way on my video of integrating cosine and sine squared. Here what I've done actually is I've started with cosine squared and I've plugged in one minus sine squared. And then I inserted the double angle formula up here, which I discussed earlier on. And if you plug that in, which is pretty straightforward, you're able to integrate the cosine squared because we have, we go from one minus sine squared here to this particular formula here. And once we're careful with our limits, we see that cosine squared integrates to pi. If we rearrange this, we are able to find out the functional form of our a sub m or a sub n, it doesn't really matter. So we find out that a sub m is equal to 1 over pi, the integral from minus pi to pi of f of r times cosine m r. Now, there is something which I, I didn't mention, and I probably should have mentioned it. I'm using a dummy variable here. Let, I'm using r inside these integrals. And you might ask, why am I doing that? Well, it, it doesn't really become clear until you derive the Fourier transform. Without the, this dummy variable, you cannot derive the Fourier transform. And it is simply good practice to use a dummy variable inside such integrals. So that is how we derive the a sub n's or the a sub, a sub m's, whichever you, you prefer. Now, in order to do the b sub n's, we do something similar. We, I'm not going to do it in the same detail. And we multiply across by sine m r, and we integrate on the same integral, minus pi to pi. This is going to result in a sine squared, which we know integrates to pi along that, that particular interval. And we get that b sub m is equal to 1 over pi, the integral of f of r, sine of m r dr. So it's very similar to the a sub m's, or the a sub n's. Just to remind you again, because I think it's important, or just to stress it, the r is nothing but a dummy variable instead of t, which we use inside the integrals, as it is in fact good practice. So summing up, we get the following. That the Fourier transform of our function of t is as we wrote at the start, and we're after now getting the functional form of a sub zero, a sub n, and b sub n. Before we move on, we must note that the coefficients are in fact transforming a function of t, although I am using a dummy variable of r, into a function of m. Well, you might wonder, how, how is that actually happening? Well, look, we're integrating out r here when we go to, we'll say, a sub 0, the, the constant. We're integrating out r here when we go to a sub n, and we're integrating out r here when we go to b sub n. So we are transforming from r to n, or from, actually what's really happening is you're transforming from t to n. So we're already seeing that we're using, the, the Fourier series is in fact involving a transform. And what's happening is we're rewriting our, fu our, fu our function in terms of cosines and sines. Now I'll discuss the physical significance of this much more in further videos.